1824, Newcastle was a small, bustling port town and county seat of Newcastle County. These activities brought many people through Newcastle, some from the surrounding area that had business with the county, and other travelers that were passing through Newcastle as they made their way up and down the East Coast. All this activity created opportunity for Newcastle residents in law, administration, transportation, and hospitality, either working for themselves or others. In the spring of 1824, however, an event occurred which dealt a huge blow to the town, its economy, and its residents. So devastating was the impact of this catastrophe that most modern-day residents still discuss it, though many may not know all the details. Much like modern-day Newcastle, the town was urban in design with long, narrow lots improved with townhouses, outbuildings, and storage buildings filling up the properties. People lived and worked in very close proximity to their neighbors. Like today, activities that occur on one property may impact neighboring properties as well. Water Street, today known as the Strand, was a bustling avenue of commercial and residential building, but that would change dramatically within a matter of hours. In this town setting lived Sarah McCullough, who was 12 years old in 1824. As she recalled later, it was on Monday, April 26, 1824. We were in school and at three o'clock was heard to us the unusual cry of fire. Without waiting for leave, all simultaneously rushed out down Reed's Alley, as it was called, when it was discovered that Mr. Bowman's board yard was on fire and that it originated in an old shanty called Riddle's Stable through two little boys, John Roberts and Dick Riddle, making a fire to warm some pups. The wind blew fiercely, and soon each neighbor feared for himself. That whole side of the street must go, said one and another, but we hope to preserve the western side on which our own home was. This was owned by my father, as well as a large store full of goods which he occupied. Also, its adjoining hotel, together with two storehouses full of grain, all these latter on the river side. Soon the flames reached these. It was now evident that they were devoted to destruction. A contemporary newspaper account provides more detail about how the fire spread so quickly. The wind was blowing fresh from the south, which sent the flames northward to Jeremiah Bowman's lumber yard, and from there continued north, consuming the remaining houses, stores, and the Union Line Hotel before being stopped by the 120 feet wide vacant lot opposite the mansion of George Reed. Sarah McCullough continued, All was confusion. Fire apparatus was hardly to be found. From Wilmington soon came help. Each did his best, but the flames continuing to spread soon crossed the street. As she stated, the fire jumped from the river side of the street to the western side at the location of the fourth lot from the corner of present-day Delaware Street. Now it burned up both sides of the street simultaneously. A Wilmington newspaper describes its progress as it burns up the street, moving from the house occupying this fourth lot, thence to two houses adjoining, one of which was occupied as a bakery. From thence it communicated to Mr. Janvier's large dwelling, thence to a small house belonging to the steamboat company, thence to Mr. Saxon's brick dwelling and stables, thence to a brick dwelling and the stores and dwelling of Mr. Raynow, thence to Mr. McCullough's dwelling house, thence to a brick house occupied as a dwelling and dry goods store also owned by McCullough, thence to the large dwelling house of George Reed Jr. Esquire with back building, etc. And here, happily, the progress of the flames were arrested between six and seven o'clock in the evening. Fire companies kept the roof of George Reed Jr.'s house sufficiently wet to prevent the flames from consuming it. Unfortunately, the home of his father, George Reed Sr., was a frame structure which stood right next door and was destroyed. Another Newcastle resident, Maria Booth Rogers, described the scene in a letter to her husband the following day. We are all here in a state of alarm and confusion. A most destructive fire broke out at about three o'clock in the afternoon in a stable or some back building of Mr. Riddle on the wharf. The wind blowing fresh from the north communicated it to the board yard which with all the buildings on that side of the street except the house occupied by Mr. Bowman and two frame ones next to it are all destroyed 
and all on the other side from Mr. Roberts to George Reed's. With difficulty, the bank and Mr. Roberts were saved. You can have no idea of the scene of horror it exhibited. Imagine the hole on fire extending to the other street, all the back buildings on both sides of Water Street, the females crying and yet actively engaged in carrying water. I am almost exhausted with fatigue. I have been carrying water and furniture all the afternoon. The furniture is lying about the streets, the market house filled, the arsenal, and almost all the street the market house stands in, some in the meeting house and some in the churchyard. A reporter for the Watchman and Delaware Advertiser newspaper wrote, So rapid was the progress of the fire that large quantities of store goods and household furniture were destroyed after they were moved into the street. Sarah McCullough described the plight of her family and 22 others. Before night, we were houseless and homeless. So were most of our neighbors. This whole property had been purchased by our father of James Gardner of Philadelphia and paid for in annual installments, the last of which had just been paid. $100 of this Mr. G kindly returned as a present. No insurance had been made. On that memorable night, I and my younger sister slept at Mr. Moody's. The whole town was in an uproar. Both the Union and Penn Fire Companies of Newcastle fought the blaze, along with many private citizens from Newcastle. A cry for help was sent to Wilmington, and additional firefighters and equipment responded. The fire burned into Tuesday night, and rains that day perhaps prevented the fire from continuing to burn. In the end, 23 homes and three inns were destroyed, and many lost their livelihoods. One-sixth of Newcastle's population was homeless, and the financial loss was estimated at upwards of $100,000. The Delaware Gazette and Peninsula Advertiser reported, Never have we seen a spectacle more distressing than this once beautiful town presents. From the north to the south on Water Street, little is to be seen but tottering walls and solitary chimneys. And this section of the place, which was once the theater of business, is now abandoned and left a solitary heap of ruin and desolation. On Tuesday night, the evening following the fire, Maria Booth Rogers continued her letter to her husband. The fire is still burning, but it has rained hard all the afternoon and no danger is now apprehended. It was really distressing this morning to walk round the town and the desolation it has made. And those that have not to lay their heads except taken in by their neighbors, looking for their furniture, some in one place and some in another. However, it is impossible to give you a full description of the scene of distress, and yet we have reason to be thankful that no lives were lost. If it had happened at night, it would have been much worse. Although I have not slept any except an hour or two this morning with my clothes on, yet I feel such a dread on my mind that I do not feel as if I wish to sleep. I feel grateful that we have escaped and have to feel distress only for others. At one time, I was apprehensive that the whole town would be burned. After the fire, the town came together to take care of its citizens. Some neighbors offered immediate assistance. Sarah McCullough remembered, The next evening, we first met our father at the hospitable table of neighbor Sawyer, and in so much distress as not for some time to see us. That evening, we two younger ones went with our Uncle James to Rosedale Farm, where we spent a week. We soon learned that our kind neighbor Sawyer had offered us a part of his house. So in we went, and childlike were delighted with the novelty, but we now had to experience straits such as we had never before known. In these quarters, we were suffered to live rent-free for one year, when, by getting $1,900 of the amount collected in Philadelphia for the sufferers, and other help, our father put up his store and dwelling house, but he never recovered in a pecuniary sense to this shock to his fortune. On April 28th, a meeting was called in Newcastle for citizens that were not directly affected by the fire to develop a plan for helping. In addition to raising money in Newcastle and Delaware, it was decided to also request assistance from other states. A committee of five men was appointed to assess the damages and organize relief efforts. The relief committee members were James R. Black, David C. Wilson, John Moody, 
Kenzie Johns Van Dyke, and Dr. Henry Colesbury. Similarly, another committee was formed to correspond with other states, cities, and towns to solicit aid. The members of this committee were James R. Black, Kenzie Johns Jr., Charles Thomas, Richard E. Smith, and Kenzie Johns Van Dyke. News of the fire traveled quickly and was reported in newspapers throughout the United States, and so was the call for aid for the families devastated by the fire. Newcastle received a great deal of financial aid from communities in other states. Philadelphia organized committees in every city ward to collect donations to send aid to Newcastle's residents and authorized the captains of steamboats operating on the Delaware to collect money for the cause as well. Boston, recalling the financial assistance Newcastle provided during the blockade of its port by the British during the American Revolution, sent aid to the city. As relief arrived, the town began the process of rebuilding. Many of the affected families did not have fire insurance, so relied on the incoming relief to help put their lives back together. One family that did have fire insurance was the Janviers. They received $2,500 from insurance and were able to rebuild on the same location as their original house, today 17 The Strand. It's worth a moment to discuss fire insurance in the 18th century. In 1752, Benjamin Franklin created the first successful fire insurance company in the colony of Pennsylvania. Franklin's Philadelphia contribution ship for the insurance of houses from loss by fire was modeled after fire insurance companies in England that had formed after the Great Fire of London in 1666. Houses bearing a fire mark are advertising that the property owners are insured against financial loss by fire. Contrary to popular belief, a house without a fire insurance marker would not be left to burn. Volunteer fire companies worked hard to extinguish all fires regardless of insurance coverage on a building. Allowing a building to burn threatened other nearby structures with destruction. Sarah McCullough's father, James, was able to rebuild after the fire as well, constructing the row of houses that today occupy 25 through 33 The Strand. Number 25 was the location of McCullough's Stage Tavern. It's easily recognized today for the large ivory soap advertisement on its side wall. In addition to rebuilding the town over the next few years, the city worked to improve its ability to fight fires in the future. Newcastle's Penn Fire Company invested in a new fire engine which they named Goodwill. It was a large engine, hand-pumped, but powerful enough to reach the highest buildings in the town. The Great Fire of 1824 so devastated the town that the event is still widely known and discussed in Newcastle today. Unfortunately, it was not the last major fire to affect Newcastle. Other fires in recent memory include the fire at the Hermitage, the Emanuel Church, the David Finney Inn, and south of Newcastle, the devastating explosion at the Amico plant. Thankfully, Newcastle is ably served by the all-volunteer Goodwill Fire Company. For more information about Goodwill, visit their website, gwfc18.com.